I think I took my minute and this 8.30, I would like to ask our boss, Dr. Cooperman, to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Chris. Again, welcome everybody and particularly Michael's welcome. It's fantastic you're here. We really appreciate it and I'm glad you're all here and those that are online as well. By way of introduction, it's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Chang, the director of the National Eye Institute to the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Dr. Chang is a pediatric ophthalmologist by training and is also board certified in clinical informatics. He went to Stanford as an undergrad, getting a degree in electrical engineering and, 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 and biology, and then went to Harvard slash MIT. I guess there's an MIT component to it for his MD degree. He also has a master's in uh, biomedical informatics from Columbia. He completed residency and fellowship training in uh, pedi uh, pediatric ophthalmology, residency in ophthalmology, of course, in pediatric ophthalmology fellowship at Hopkins uh, Wilmer Eye Institute. Um, he then was a faculty member at Columbia for almost 10 years and went to Portland and Oregon Health Sciences University for another 10 years before becoming the director of the NEI in November of 2020, getting on two years ago. Um, he has extensive research experience, research uh, uh, in, uh, on in application of biomedical informatic methods to clinical ophthalmology in areas such as retinopathy prematurity, telehealth, artificial intelligence, and clinical information systems. Uh, he has uh, published over 200 papers and has achieved uh, a uh, breakthrough status uh, from the USD, uh, FDA uh, for an assistive artificial intelligence system for ROP. Um, and so again, it's such a great honor and privilege. We're very happy you're here. Uh, it's an honor for us to be here and appreciate your time and effort to get to know us better while we also get to know you better. So thank you so much for coming. Looking forward to hearing your presentation. Thanks so much, Michael. No, Barry, thank you for that introduction and really to you and Chris for the invitation to come here and speak. Um, I would say that it's a real privilege for me to be here um, and get, get to know all of you a little bit um, more. Uh, you know, I've now been in Irvine probably about 16 hours, um, but uh, you know, just from having spent time yesterday with people like Chris, Barry, Vladimir, and uh, you know, Michael Stamos, Jeff, um, I, mean, I, just, he's, I, I feel like I've gotten to know this place much, much better um, already. And just thank you for your, um, uh, you know, just hospitality and hosting my visit. Um, uh, you know, I, um, oh, here, let me, this, what I, um, I was asked to talk about this topic. I, I was basically given the title, the future of vision research. Okay. And, uh, you know, one thing I could have done is just put a picture up of, you know, people like Chris Pauchewski and be done with it. Um, but but I, I thought that we should subtitle it um, Perspectives from the NEI. Okay, what we're going to be, what we're interested in at the NEI and how we see the future um, playing out. And just, you know, would love to find ways that obviously we can work together to sort of build that future of vision research. Um, and so, so what I'll do is spend probably 50 minutes or so talking about, um, uh, talking about that. And just by um, way of introduction, I've been in this job for barely a year and a half now. And one of the things that I've really um, discovered is that a big part of my job is communicating with people who are really the ones who, who actually do the work. Uh, and so, I, you know, communication, it, it's just tough, okay? Even without a pandemic, you know, I've recognized how difficult it is to sort of get the word out about things we've been trying to use social media um, as a way to do that. Okay, so, um, uh, you know, this Twitter handle we've set up, NEI Director, uh, is how I've been trying to do that. Um, you know, one of the things I used to hate uh, when I was out there in the community is, you know, I couldn't apply for this grant opportunity because I didn't know about it until right before the deadline. Uh, and so we're trying just not to have that happen. And, you know, I'm trying to use this to publicize grant opportunities, just, just news from the vision community that would be good to know. So it feels a little bit ridiculous to be sitting here trolling for followers, but that, that, that's the reason that, um, uh, that, that that's the reason that we do this. Okay. So let, let me go ahead and get started. Um, the, uh, as Chris said, we were founded, what, what's the NEI? Okay, we were founded in 1968 by Congress and then President Lyndon Johnson as the branch of the NIH to manage national efforts in vision science. 
Okay, and um, you know what we do is we direct research and we fund research. Okay, our budget is it changes depends on what happens in Congress, but um, it's about eight hundred million dollars uh, right now. And why do we exist? Um, because of the impact of vision on quality of life. Okay, you know many surveys have shown that. Uh, vision loss and blindness are among those things that Americans uh, fear the most. Okay. And uh, you know, I, I, I obviously there's impact of vision on activities of daily living, but I, I just want to emphasize that vision impacts how we experience the world. Okay, now we were talking last night at dinner about you know our kids, and you know, I have two daughters, and you know, I'm always going to remember their first steps because that that's a visual memory. Okay, and uh, you know when people lose that. Uh, uh, you know, there's risk of social isolation, uh, risk of depression, accelerated dementia, and that there was a you know, nice article in the New York Times uh, a couple months ago uh, highlighting work at the University of Washington about this. Okay. And uh, but the other point that I want to make is that the impact of uh, vision research on science is enormous. Yeah, I'm going to give a few examples of that, but. You know, just at the NEI, um, you know, we're really proud to have funded the work of eight Nobel Prize winners. And the point that I want to make from this is that uh, uh, there are many seminal innovations that occurred first in the eye and the visual system because it's such an accessible system uh, for doing things. And so the point is that you do that work first in the visual system, and then it gets applied to other uh, diseases, other areas of science. And so that, that's something that I think is really important to keep in mind. Okay, so impact on science and impact on quality of life overall. Okay. So um, when I started about a year and a half ago, one of the first things we did is that we took a careful look at our mission statement. Okay, so every organization has a mission statement. And ours hadn't been revised since 1968. Uh, and so we, um, uh, we spent months looking at this. You get all these stakeholders involved. And this is what we came up with. It, it's the bold faced text here that our mission is to eliminate vision loss and improve quality of life through vision research. Okay, so short text uh, took six months to, to write that. Um, how do we do that? Uh, we provide leadership in these four areas. Uh, number one, we drive innovative research. We foster collaboration. Uh, we recruit, inspire, and train a talented and diverse uh, group uh, to strengthen our vision workforce. And we educate people about what we do and why it's important. Okay, now who do we educate? Um, uh, providers, scientists, policymakers, and the general public. Okay, so I I'm really hoping that we can uh, be what I'd call a mission-driven organization, okay, eliminating vision loss, improving quality of life through research. Uh, so the other thing that we did is we um, uh, published a strategic plan. Okay, we do this every five years. Um, and, you know, it happens that this is our first plan since 2012. And if you go to this QR code, it takes you to that. The executive summary is like 15 pages. Okay, and uh, so in a nutshell, the way that this is organized is that there are seven uh, what we call cross-cutting areas of emphasis. Okay, genetics, neuroscience, immunology, regenerative medicine, data science, quality of life, and public health and disparities. And uh, that's what the plan is organized around. Uh, now, those of you, many of you know NEI very well, and uh, you know that our portfolio is organized uh, anatomically, right? It's retina, cornea, lens, glaucoma, optic neuropathy, et cetera. And um, the way that I like to um, explain or think about this is that academic ophthalmology departments are organized anatomically and by disease. So it's like the um, horizontal lines here. And basic science departments are organized methodologically, uh, genetics, neuroscience, immunology. And so we just thought this was the best way to um, uh, foster collaborations by marrying the methodology with the disease. Okay, so um, what, I, what I wanna do is just go through um, these seven areas. And for each of the seven areas, um, I'll just say a little bit about what it's about um, uh, you know, what we identified in the planning process is some of those opportunities um, uh, for growth. And I'll just give a couple examples of things that we've done in the last year at NEI, programs that we've created, uh, you know, based on that area of emphasis. Okay? And the point here, obviously, is that in the coming years, we're going to be doing more and more that relates to these areas of emphasis. Okay, so now disclaimer is that uh, what I talk about is not the only thing that's going on, and it's not necessarily the thing that I think is most important. So th there's a lot that we're interested in that's not, you know, that, that is obviously not going to be in the next 50 minutes. Okay, so let me just get started with that. So 
Um, number one out of seven is genes, genetics. Okay. And now intuitively, when I started my clinical practice 20 years ago, uh, within the first few months of my practice, I saw a baby uh, who we diagnosed with labor congenital amaurosis. Okay, now, you know, those of you who know this disease uh, know that it, it, it's really not a good diagnosis, that babies will basically lose their vision, you know, pretty quickly. Okay. And as a physician, uh, that's, you know, Barry mentioned, you know, yes, I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist. Um, and that is very unsettling to tell a family that your baby is essentially going to go blind, um, you know, pretty quickly. Okay, and that there's nothing we can do about it. We can provide supportive care. Okay, so I actually think it's remarkable that now it's 20 years later and there is something that we can do about it. Okay, the first FDA approved gene therapy in any field of medicine uh, for an inherited disease was for this disease, uh, RP65 driven labor congenital amaurosis. And you know, I, I really think it's a great story that it was based on decades of basic science research. Um, you know, I'm really proud that um, Michael Redmond is someone who's in our NEI intramural program, you know, led the group that cloned, that first cloned uh, that gene. And of course, there was a lot of work in animal models that was led by that many people. And you know, this is a video that I got from Gene Bennett at the University of Pennsylvania that shows these mobility mazes before versus after uh, gene therapy. Um, and I, I think it's remarkable that before, you know, the, you know, the woman is very tentative, you know, can't take these steps. And afterwards, she's able to go through really, really um, uh, easily. And these things just take my breath away every single time that, you know, even now that if you, if, if you would have told somebody this back in 2001, they, they would have said this was science fiction. Okay. So um, I, I, and the, the, one of the points that I want to make from this is that it boils down to the accessibility of the eye. Okay. For doing that examination, like looking at outcome measures and, and just delivering drugs. Uh, to it. Okay, so um, uh, more on this coming up. But one of the premises of um, uh, why do we have this an area, as an area of emphasis? Um, you know, there are more genetic mutations causing eye disease than any other uh, organ in the body. And I, I never knew that. And intuitively, the basis is that for a lot of these systemic diseases, um, uh, the mutations, they're lethal, right? But when they occur in the retina or in the eye, uh, they cause vision loss. And so I think this is one of these areas that hopefully we can learn things um, uh, from vision disease that will then be uh, uh, generalizable to other areas where we can you know, save vision, but also save lives. Okay, so um, uh, with diseases like LCA, they're Mendelian. Okay, sim single mutations, typically very, very rare. These inherited retinal degenerations, um, you know, very rare. And you know, we, we can go from disease biology to treatments, you know, like we showed on the previous slide. The problem is that most common diseases are not just one gene, okay, they're multifactorial. And, uh, you know, it's multiple genes, environmental factors, okay, think myopia, AMD, uh, glaucoma, okay, so, so multifactorial. And, you know, another area of innovation, uh, you know, 15 years ago, uh, you know, one of the first major successes in GWAS uh, was for complement factor H. Okay, and since then, we had a lot of genetic consortia that we've supported, you know, a lot of, um, you know, loci, you know, variants. Yeah, but the problem is that they're really, and they, they've focused on the role of things like complement pathway. Um, the problem, though, is that, uh, you know, we really haven't had very much success looking at clinical trials um, uh, uh, involving the complement pathway. And so I think that the premise of this is that we really um, need to do a better job of going from, from genes to biological mechanisms to be able to develop treatments in the future. Okay. So um, with that, let, let me just point out a couple um, uh, opportunities that we um, have identified here. One of them is data sharing. And you know, I, I talked with um, you know, Jeff Abbott just right before this about this exact um, concept that to understand complex systems interactions, um, you know, we need research networks and we need databases. And um, at, at, you know, one of the, I, I think, um, uh, hallmarks of this is you know, public sharing of data. Okay, so one of the challenges I think that happens in science is that we've got a lot of situations, and it's not just genetics research, it's all sorts of you know, research, um, uh, where there are multiple centers in the country uh, that are basically doing the same project, more or less. Mm -hmm. Um, in parallel, yet we're all underpowered to really answer the question uh, that's, um, uh, that we're trying to answer. And uh, yet a lot of times these investigators are not really incentivized to share their data. In fact, I would argue that our system disincentivizes people uh, to share data. And so that, that, that's one problem. Um, another thing is that honestly, even if those two groups wanted to share data, in general, they can't. 
Okay, because they collected their data inconsistently. And it can take years to harmonize if you collect things differently up front. Okay, so, so I think we've got, you know, what we need is public, um, you know, better sharing of data and we need better standardization of data representations. Okay, so um, in, in terms of um, a policy, now there is an NIH sharing, data sharing policy that becomes active in uh, January, 2023. And, you know, the White House recently published a public access policy uh, for data sharing. And you know, those, those are what I would call sticks, right? It's like, you know, we're not gonna fund your research unless you share your data. Uh, but, but I really, really think that our community needs, incent our community needs incentives uh, to share data. And so one of the things that, um, you know, in other words, carrots, right, to go with those sticks. Um, one of the things that we worked on is that, um, you know, we got the editors of uh, many of the major vision journals together. Okay, you know, seven of the um, I and vision journals. And, you know, what can we do together, you know, as editors in chief and as, um, as us at NIH? And, uh, you know, one of the things that we came up with was like, let's create a, a vision data set uh, publication type, okay, software, a, a data set or a publication uh, or a software library. And, uh, you know, who, who was the first one that implemented this was Marcos Arvin, okay, who's the editor in chief of TVST. Uh, the Arvo Open Access Journal, uh, and um, uh, together with Pierce Keen and Aaron Lee, Pierce and Aaron are um, on the editorial board of TVST. And so we basically created this um, uh, publication type where the idea is that you write a paper based on your data set. Okay, so it's not a tag along to your um, uh, science, it's a freestanding um, uh, paper. And hopefully it's gonna be things like that where um, you know, people will get academic credit, you, know, you can cite your data, find it using PubMed, and um, uh, of those editor groups, Emily Chu uh, from Ophthalmology Science is also working on implementing this and hoping to do more of that within the vision community, sort of to create a culture that I, I hope truly incentivizes um, data sharing. Okay, so that, that, that's one of the opportunities. Um, another opportunity that we saw in this strategic planning process is model system development. And, uh, you know, with uh, Vladimir Kefla, we, we talked about this in the drive back from LAX, you know, yesterday. Um, uh, that you know, you know well-defined um, uh, animal systems or um, cell-based systems, they're really the hallmark of um, uh, basic and translational research. And animal models now often don't represent those unique attributes of, um, you know, for example, the primate retina or the visual cortex, you know, for example, um, you know, cone-rich fovea. And then you know, we really need to address those gaps in animal models. And uh, you know, if we're gonna study things like, you know, the connections between genes and disease, disease mechanisms, you know, we're going to have these animal models. They're going to have to represent um, uh, things like temporal and spatial control of gene expression. Okay, so those are gaps, and obviously there are big gaps in terms of uh, human base, uh, uh, human cell base models, things like organoids. And you know, we we talked about this as well. You know, you know, Vladimir about that these these systems often don't have the complexity of um, you know the systems level complexity of animal models, and so uh, I, I think we're going to need standards and best practices for developing these um, uh, cell based models that truly are valuable. And uh, you know one of the so here's an example of a program that we're working on now: uh, gene therapy. Uh, so uh, the foundation of the NIH, um, the FNIH, has um, uh, sponsored a public private partnership. Uh, who's involved? Um, uh, the FDA, uh, industry, and also multiple institutes at the NIH, you know, of which we're one. And you know, how much money? Uh, $76 million over five years. So this kicked off uh, last year. And the, the premise of this, the goal, is that you know, we're trying to develop gene therapy platforms and standards for ultra-rare diseases, you know, things like the inherited retinal degenerations. And um, you know, from, a basic, from a scientific perspective, it's things like uh, optimizing the creation of uh, vectors for gene delivery. And this particular one is focused on AAV for, for various reasons that I won't get into. And um, uh, from a trial uh, perspective, um, uh, the goals of this are to standardize vector generation, to harmonize manufacturing practices, and also just to streamline regulatory pathways um, for FDA approval. And the point of this is that Peter Marks from the FDA was really involved uh, with creating this. And the point here is that um, uh, if there are diseases with only a few hundred people who have this, um, there, there's not a company that's going to want to get involved uh, with this. But if you can create a generalizable pathway, uh, it would de-risk that for the entire commercial sector. Okay, so um, you know, why is this re relevant to the vision field? Obviously, it's because there's so many genetic eye diseases and so much work in gene therapy already. Okay, now, um, uh, what happened is that um, uh, six, nine months ago, uh, this group put out an application process 
uh, where uh, diseases could get nominated and reviewed as candidates to support future trials in gene therapy. And one thing that I was really proud of is that our community really responded to that RFP. And uh, it turned out that of the 14 candidates that were selected for diseases for gene therapy trials, five of them uh, came from the vision field. They're either uh, corneal or retinal uh, diseases. And I think that, that was a big um, positive for our community. There's a lot of potential work in this area. And so there are some active requests for um, proposal now involving AAV biology and also clinical trials. Okay, so uh, happening right now, it's something that we're pretty, um, that we're pretty excited about. Okay, so number two is neuroscience. Now, obviously been a huge amount of, uh, you know, really seminal work in neuroscience in the vision field. And, uh, you know, you should know about the brain initiative uh, and the blueprint uh, um, uh, for neuroscience research. Uh, these are trans NIH projects. Now, the brain initiative is a, uh, uh, led by a guy, John Nye, who used to be at Berkeley. And, um, you know, billions of dollars, several billion dollars um, uh, uh, put into this project. And the goal of this is to build, basically develop imaging and functional tools to understand the human brain. Okay, and there's been some really nice work involving the vision system. Uh, uh, people like Josh Sainz at Harvard uh, developed a, basically a complete retinal cell atlas. And um, uh, Sebastian Sung at Princeton has done some really, really nice work involving um, uh, connectomics, uh, the so-called iWire project, where they're basically crowdsourcing um, inputs to, you know, how do you, um, uh, how do these different neurons connect to each other? And some, there's some beautiful maps uh, that they've published there. Okay, and uh, uh, the human connectome uh, is a much smaller project. It's on the order of tens of billion, uh, tens of millions of dollars. Um, but the, uh, the point of this is basically to create maps of neuronal connections. And the way that they do this is that, you know, we've recorded and uh, we've uh, 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 recruited cohorts of participants uh, and basically characterize them using imaging, genetics, behavioral data. And there, there are kids involved. Okay, the point being, we can look at the developing uh, 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 nervous system and also adults, older adults, you know, you know senescence, okay, the opposite um, end. And, you know, within the vision field, uh, there's one cohort um, uh, of patients with central vision loss and one cohort of, peop cohort of people with low vision. And I think those groups were in Alabama and uh, you know, one was in um, uh, uh, Los Angeles okay, that did this work. So really, really nice work. Um, but you know, some of the opportunities I think here are relatively obvious. Um, uh, visual processing. Uh, this is an area where we have beautiful data, um, uh, beautiful methodologies, uh, imaging data, um, brain atlas data. I got this um, uh, uh, from David Huang and Yali Jia, uh, who I used to work with um, in Oregon, OCT um, and geography. And um, physiology um, uh, data, physiologic um, uh, computational methods. And the, the point of this, I think, is pretty obvious that um, if we want to restore vision, uh, we have to understand um, uh, retinal information processing and uh, cortical information processing. Um, and, uh, you know, some of that's going to come from theoretical models and computational models, and some of it's going to come from analytical uh, validation using these tools. Okay, but I think that there's a lot of gaps in knowledge now that we have involving, okay, what are the subtypes of neurons, uh, what are the computational roles of different parts of the um, uh, vision pathway, and one really big area is uh, that's emerging now is what are the role of glial cells. Okay, and you know, non-neuronal cells. Okay, so I think this is hotter than I've ever seen it. Okay, so a lot of um, uh, uh, promise in these areas. Now, plasticity is another thing that we've gotten really interested in. Uh, and uh, you know, what's plasticity? The ability of neurons to reconnect uh, after injury. Uh, you know, in, uh, babies and young children are obviously really good at that. Okay, that's the basis of learning. And you know, adults, you know, not always so good. Um, and so amblyopia is one thing that I, I saw a lot of as a pediatric ophthalmologist. And, you know, we really don't do a very good job of treating amblyopia in 2022. And uh, there really hasn't been much, uh, you know, there really hasn't been any, uh, you know, major advance in how we treat this. And so it's my hope that through understanding uh, visual circuitry, you know, maybe we can develop better treatments for disease like this um, that are based on plasticity mechanisms. Okay. So, um, you know, one program that I just want to highlight in this involves ocular pain. Okay, uh, Humam Araj is a program officer um, at the NEI who some of you may know, and he was the one who spearheaded this. It's part of what we're calling the anterior segment initiative, you know, just to develop some programs involving the front of the eye and, you know, give that a little bit of um, uh, special attention. But um, uh, the gap in knowledge here is that, um, you know, we don't really understand a lot of those pathways. Um, that contribute to things like 
ocular surface pain, uh, dry eye pain, uh, photophobia. And yeah, I know that there are some folks here who do some really nice work uh, in dry eye. And um, uh, you know, so you know, the programs that we're hoping to inspire here are gonna be, okay, what are the neuronal cell types? And what are, you know, for example, the cell-cell interactions that are involved in the pathways that cause um, things like this. And so, so what we want to do is contribute up, contribute up to $5 million for projects in, uh, in, within this year uh, in this area. Okay. So uh, number three is immunology. And I know we've got a couple of world experts um, you know, here in uh, ocular immunology and uh, uveitis. And um, so you know, all of you um, know that historically, you know, the eye, we've always thought of this as an immune privileged um, uh, organ. And, you know, that's the basis, you know, why was corneal transplantation successful you know, decades before other um, transplantations? And, um, you know, but despite that, it's really becoming more and more clear that the eye uh, has its own specialized immune system. And you know, those pathways have become more and more, um, uh, you know, there's been more and more understood that it's not just, you um, uh, inflammatory diseases and uveitis or viral infections, um, but it's also uh, neurodegenerative diseases of the eye, diabetic retinopathy, AMD, glaucoma, you know, where these pathways have really been implicated. Okay, so really, uh, you know, it's never been so clear to me that, you know, to really understand ocular physiology and disease, you really have to understand immunology. Okay. And um, uh, so what are some of the opportunities here? Uh, number one, uh, immune homeostasis. Okay, it really got onto my radar screen uh, that uh, there's upper regulation and down regulation, and we really need to better understand these regulatory mechanisms that support um, normal function and disease. And um, you know, we need better disease models. Okay, I think our disease models now are much better at acute disease than chronic disease, and, and they're much better at sort of the positive factors than the negative factors involving disease. And you know, I actually don't know that we have very good disease models for immunosenescence. Okay. Uh, so those are a couple of the uh, things. Now, in terms of therapies, now obviously Barry Cooperman's a world expert in terms of uh, uveitis and uh, trials for this. But um, you know, are there better steroid agents, steroid sparing agents that um, uh, that we should be developing? And that that really gets into this whole data sharing thing. That these are these are um, by nature rare diseases. And I don't think it's going to be possible to do this without a strong clinical trials infrastructure for validation. Okay. Uh, so one, one of the other opportunities that we identified was the microbiome. Okay, now, those of you who know about this um, know that uh, uh, within um, uh, the gut microbiome uh, 10 years ago started to become really hot. Okay, there was good evidence that uh, it was implicated for diseases like uveitis, uh, but also more recently, um, AMD and glaucoma. Okay. And um, you know, one of the things that came up as we looked into our strategic planning process was that you know, we really don't know very much about the ocular surface microbiome. Okay, so there's a lot of gaps in knowledge, uh, not only with um, uh, gut microbiome, but also with um, you know, ocular surface microbiome. What's normal? Okay, what can go wrong? And you know, how does it relate to disease pathogenesis? So, so some of what's going on in um, uh, immunology now is um, along the eyes of along the lines of this anterior segment initiative. We have a notice of special interest involving biomarkers for dry eye disease. Okay, and those of you who are clinicians will know that uh, there are signs and there are symptoms. And in dry eye disease, uh, you often see patients who bitterly complain of things. Yet when you look at their ocular surface, it really doesn't look that uh, really doesn't look that bad. And so the point of this um, uh, NOSI is that we're trying to really um, uh, uh, support, you know, we're really trying to uh, encourage research looking at better biomarker-based methods to diagnose eye disease, because there's really not a good standard right now. And uh, one of the other things that we've done over the past year um, is uh, we've had a series of workshops. Okay. Uh, one of them was in May of last year um, that was hosted by Reza Dana um, at Harvard and Nita Shen, who's at um, uh, Johnson Johnson, um, about anterior segment inflammation. And uh, uh, in August 2021, uh, Russ Van Gelder at, um, at, at Washington and Karen Nelson from Thermal Fisher Scientific uh, hosted a workshop uh, involving uh, basically the ocular surface microbiome and the methodological um, uh, uh, research. And, um, you know, out of, um, out of that so far has come out um, a, a, a U24 um, 
uh, RFP that was basically um, a characterization of the ocular surface microbiome. Okay, the deadline for that was just a couple months ago. And um, so we're starting to you know, look at that now. Okay, so those are some of the things that we're um, uh, that we're excited about, and uh, you know, from our from our shop, uh, Lisa Newhold and Marianne Redford were the people who helped organize this. If you're interested in that, so those are the contact people at NEI. Okay, so um, number four is uh, one that you know I, I feel a little bit ridiculous standing up here talking about because you know we've got some of the world experts here um, in regenerative medicine, um, but let me just sort of back up uh, and say that there's a whole area of um, methodologies uh, uh, that I think is really promising. Like how do we how do we reestablish normal function? Okay, when neurons when neurons die, how do we restore them and reconnect uh, those pathways? Now, I, you know, I, I don't know if the winner is going to be gene therapy, gene editing, cell reprogramming, you know, cell based therapies, but. Uh, Paul Sieving, who was my predecessor, you know, really pushed uh, the Audacious Goals Initiative, and we're really trying to continue uh, with that, where the uh, AGI, Audacious Goals, started in about 2013, and the goal of this was to develop methods to regenerate neurons and neural connections, specifically involving photoreceptors and ganglion cells, okay, so they really focus on diseases like um, inherited retinal degenerations and AMD. Okay, and uh, the way that this worked was that the, uh, we funded a series of collaborative teams, and uh, it's, it's about $80 million total. Um, and there were three teams, um, there were three groups of collaborative teams. Uh, one of them, which Chris pay, played an enormous role in, was functional imaging. And uh, the goal here was, you know, if we're going to reconnect um, neurons, we have to be able to visualize them. Okay, so it was adaptive optics, you know, things like two photon imaging, you know, you know really brilliant um, work. And uh, uh, the second set of consortia was regenerative factors. Uh, so the question is, well, you know, how do we know what the factors are that are going to help neurons rewire? And, you know, can we identify those chemical factors? So that was a set of consortia. And uh, the third um, set of consortia is one that's, um, you know, you know, in the middle of being underway right now, which is um, translation enabling models. For example, how do we develop animal models that are going to take us toward clinical trials? Okay, so uh, AGI was in those um, those areas, and um, one of the opportunities that we're really excited about is um, uh, cell replacement. Okay, and something that I'm really proud of is uh, Kapil Bardi, uh, who some of you know, is one of the NEI uh, intramural investigators. And he's done some beautiful work um, in cell replacement over the past um, 10 years, where what they've done is um, uh, taken um, uh, blood cells, isolate um, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells, and use them to grow um, uh, retinal pigment epithelium cells. And they've developed methods to grow those cells on scaffolds. Um, and the point is that these scaffolds um, uh, dissolve, and then you transplant them underneath the retina of um, uh, uh, pigs or um, about a month ago, uh, the first in human um, surgery was done. And uh, it was the, the surgeons were Amir Kashani from Johns Hopkins and Shilpa Kadati from NEI. And uh, uh, that was just a safety um, uh, study, but you know, so far it's been, it, 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 you know, we're really excited about how things are going with that. Okay, so I, I think there's gonna be a lot of work that comes out of this, uh, but uh, you know, what are we gonna need? Um, uh, uh, good manufacturing practices uh, for managing cells, uh, quality control automation. Uh, you know, from a methodological perspective, you know, how do we tell whether these um, transplants really worked? Uh, did they rewire? Um, did the ganglion cells rewire to the brain? You know, how do you prevent disease from recurring? So it's it's a lot of um, questions, and it's obviously it's not just about the um, uh, retina. There's some beautiful work involving um, uh, cell-based therapies in the cornea. Okay, so. Um, uh, you know, another thing that we've gotten really excited about is other methodologies, okay, extracellular vesicles, um, uh, uh, immune, uh, you know, gene editing, and, you know, Chris, I think I I've been amazed by some of the work that his group has done involving gene editing, um, and, you know, what are the gaps in knowledge here? Well, I think there's a lot of questions involving safety and precision, and there's been some beautiful work done by, you know, many group, uh, you know, the Blackshaw group at Johns Hopkins involving cellular reprogramming. Uh, and so I, I don't know which of these is going to be the methodologies that you know, are the ones that really um, uh, are most promising toward curing disease. But regardless of what they are, I, I think that one area that we've really identified as a gap in knowledge is the immune response. 
uh, you know, how do we modulate that? And you know, are there areas where the immune response is going to end up um, uh, interfering with the results of this? And so that that's something that um, uh, well, let me just let me just talk about some new programs that are going on now, and that this will this will come out. Um, so one thing that we've done in the past year is we've um, uh, put out what we call the Integrative Biology Initiative okay, regarding uh, regenerative medicine. Uh, so the, the premise of this is that um, uh, there was a um, multi-center trial, the ARIDS uh, two study that was led by Emily Chu and Rick Ferris. Uh, it's gone on for, uh, you know, it, it's a decades old um, study, but it studied uh, AMD. And so because of that, we've got a lot of data involving these patients. And there were 65 of these patients in particular uh, that we phenotyped really, really carefully. Uh, now we work with the New York Stem Cell Foundation to generate induced purple and stem cell lines from those patients. And uh, you know, because those patients were ARIDS clinical trial patients, there's very rich clinical data. You know, we've done whole genome sequencing uh, and uh, you know, there's very rich imaging data on those patients, uh, fundus photography and OCT data. And uh, we've also, in addition to generating those um, iPSC lines, um, uh, it, uh, uh, generated isogenic controls with those risk alleles uh, corrected. Okay, so the point of this um, integrative biology initiative is uh, that people would write grants and get access to those data. And hopefully that'll be a paradigm to be, learn things about physiology and pathogenesis um, from those. And so we issued it once and uh, you know, we're probably gonna issue it once more. Okay, if this is an area that you're interested in, I just want you to know that those data are, are, are gonna be available. And uh, you know, there's a 3D retinal, retinal organoid challenge in the spirit of animal, in the spirit of disease models. Uh, and it went through three phases and we just finished the third phase uh, now. And some really nice work by um, uh, folks at the University of Colorado, uh, Van, Val Cantor Soler and um, Natalia Vergara, uh, and also Ada Einstein, okay, Wei Lu. Uh, those were the winners of this um, organoid challenge. And um, in terms of uh, audacious goals, um, uh, we hosted a transplant immunology workshop. Okay, what can we do to be um, uh, stimulating research involving modulating the immune system, regardless of what type of um, regenerative medicine approaches you're using? And so that was just about a month ago. And uh, Tom Greenwell and Amber Reed were the ones from NEI who organized that. It's going to take us a while to um, uh, synthesize everything from that. But so hopefully more coming out about that relatively soon. Okay, so that's, uh, that, that's regenerative medicine. And um, so area five out of seven is data science. And uh, you know, sometimes I, I've been introducing this um, with this question, uh, what is the one tool that every single scientist and clinician uses uh, in this country? And you know, if you're a clinician, people will say, well, maybe it's a stethoscope, maybe it's an ophthalmoscope, um, but you know, there are actually uh, enough ophthalmologists who don't use ophthalmoscopes, okay? And, uh, you know, I would argue that the one tool is a computer and computing devices. Okay, and and so um, so one of the hallmarks of twenty first century science is what I'd call unprecedented access to large scale data. Um, and one of the things that I think is a real strength of the vision field is that you know, regardless of what type of data you deal with, um, biological data, in other words, genetic data, omics data. Uh, imaging data, there's a ton of imaging data in, um, in vision science, um, uh, clinical data from electronic health records or population-based data. Um, uh, you know, there aren't that many fields in any area of science or medicine where there's such easy access to that whole spectrum, okay, regardless of whether you're studying um, uh, molecular processes or uh, up to populations. So it's this common set of data science methodologies. Okay, so real strength of the vision field to span that whole spectrum. Um, now, um, one of the innovations in this area is artificial intelligence. And I, I have to just promote this a little bit that um, uh, about two years ago, I captured this tweet from Eric Topol. Um, of all the medical specialties, uh, most people think radiology is leading the artificial intelligence movement, but it's actually ophthalmology so far. Okay. And uh, the reason for that is that we've got so much data in the form of images and clinical outcomes data. Okay, structured. And so that, that, that's a perfect setup for doing AI um, work. Okay. And uh, so, you know, some of you know that the first FDA approved uh, autonomous artificial intelligence system in any field of medicine was for diabetic retinopathy. Okay, it was Michael Abramoff at the University of Iowa. 
and uh, and the folks at Google uh, uh, have done some beautiful work involving knowledge discovery. And uh, you know, for those of you who don't know, uh, they were able to train these deep learning systems to um, analyze retinal photographs, and purely from the photograph, uh, with almost 100% accuracy, to tell whether that photograph came from a male patient or a female patient. Okay. And to, to clinicians, that was unbelievable when this was published four years ago because there's no way that any of us can look at a patient's retina and tell, okay, was that patient male or female? But presumably there's some data encoded in the pixels that confers gender, okay? And so, so the promise here, of course, maybe, maybe someday we can take advantage of that from a knowledge discovery perspective. Okay? So, so major advances here. And um, so one of the programs that we're really interested in is what I'll call uh, image standards. So, huge amounts of data that comes um, in the vision field and data come from uh, machines like this. They generate pictures and they generate numbers, right? And uh, the problem is that um, a lot of these data are locked in proprietary standards. And so you can't get access to those data as a researcher or as a clinician. Okay, now just intuitively, uh, a couple anecdotes from my own um, life are that um, as a clinician, I used to work in a department where we had two image management systems that collected images because each one couldn't interface with all the devices that generate those images. Okay, you know, you know photo, uh, fundus photography, OCT, visual field machines, okay, they didn't all talk to each other. Okay, and uh, if you think about it intuitively, that makes no sense, okay, that these things are supposed to all collect the same data. And you know, I, I worked with a PhD student um, uh, who wanted to do glaucoma um, uh, uh, artificial intelligence for his thesis. And he was an informatics PhD student, not a, not a Luddite, you know, didn't know how to manage data. And he spent a year trying to get data from these machines, couldn't get it and switched to something else for his dissertation work. Okay. And so, so this is a big problem for research and for clinical care. And, um, you know, I've been sort of um, uh, trying to tackle this for about 15 years and, you know, we've really gotten nowhere uh, with this. So um, in May of 2022, um, uh, we hosted a workshop uh, and who really um, organized this, Carrie Getz from the NEI and Aaron Lee from the University of Washington, um, uh, who also is closely tied with the American Academy of Ophthalmology. And, uh, and of course, this workshop took like nine months to plan. And who was involved? Um, you know, we were involved and the rationale is that, you know, we support research. Uh, the FDA was involved. Okay, Malvina Edelman uh, was the lead on that. And uh, why FDA? because they regulate devices. Okay. And the ONC uh, was involved and, and that's led by Mac Mickey Tripathi. And why the ONC? Because they regulate uh, EHR data and um, uh, data exchange. And you know, these are the people who certify for meaningful use in electronic health record systems. And so um, the point of this workshop was, how can we identify barriers and solutions toward widespread adoption of standards so all these devices speak the same language? And uh, you know, what are the levers that we can use in the federal um, government to try to promote that if we need? And so there's going to be an um, editorial coming out that was written by the American Academy of Ophthalmology and by ARVO leadership. And we're going to have more coming out on this, but I really want to solve this problem. Okay? It's going to take a lot of these people working together, uh, you know, scientists, doctors, and vendors. Okay. And uh, another uh, program that I another couple programs I want to let you know about are um, uh, programs involving artificial intelligence. Okay, uh, Bridge to AI is a trans NIH uh, so-called common fund project. Okay, it involves all the different um, NIH institutes, and um, uh, the way that common fund proposals work is that they, they're led by a certain number of um, institutes, and you know we were on one of the five leads for this um, uh, project. And um, the, the premise of Bridge to AI is to build large data sets from multiple sources. So they would span images, clinical data, omics data, you know, patient-generated wearable data. Um, and it's over $130 million over four years uh, that we've uh, committed to this. And um, the, the traditionally, the, the, the thing that's different about this is that traditionally, NIH-funded research is hypothesis-driven, right? But in this case, we're spending $130 million for hypothesis-generating data. It's basically building data sets uh, 
that are um, uh, good AI ready that span different disciplines. And hopefully this is something that the community is gonna benefit from for years afterwards. Okay, so, so really, really different paradigm. And we're really trying to inject some of that into, um, into NIH. Okay, so uh, just announced a couple of days ago that there were four data generation sites um, uh, awarded. And one of them was led by an ophthalmology group. Okay, this is uh, Cecilia Lee and Aaron Lee at the University of Washington who are studying diabetes. Um, and so that, that's something that we're obviously excited about because I think it's just, um, and there, there's some other really, really neat work, uh, you know, acoustics, you know, did diagnosing disease from, um, you know, your voice and some of these other um, projects. But, you know, look into this if you're, um, if you're interested. And uh, another thing that I want to tell you about is Aim Ahead. Okay, so... Um, Aim Ahead is a trans NIH project that was led by the um, NIH Office of Data Science Strategy, and the head of that is Susan Gregoric, who's wonderful. Um, and the um, so let me uh, this had its genesis about a year ago, and the question was, you know, what can we most um, where can we best spend money? Uh, it would be Sorry. oh sure. It's on the screen that we're trying to get rid of. Okay, I didn't. Uh, th thank you. And so the question is, um, you know, we want to spend $100 million on something involving artificial intelligence, and electronic health records. Uh, what can we do? And so there was a group of people who got together, a lot of consultants from industry uh, and, you know, academia talked about this. And what, what uh, uh, we decided on was artificial intelligence and machine learning to address challenges of health disparities and minority health. <clears throat> okay. And, uh, uh, you know, what do we mean by that? Um, one of them is developing diverse data sets. Okay, now I, I, I used to work in Oregon where the population there is not really that diverse. And um, uh, you know, when we develop um, uh, AI systems, they really have to reflect the population. You know, because you, know, you don't want a system that works for one uh, race, but not another race or one population, not another population. And that has potential to, you know, you, you, you'll be really bad uh, societally. And uh, you know, another um, uh, uh, goal of this is to train a diverse workforce. Uh, for some of these medically underserved areas, uh, the clinics that serve them don't even have electronic health records, okay, let alone artificial intelligence. And so how do we get those groups um, you know, up to speed more? And also developing artificial intelligence approaches to detect bias. And uh, you know, if these systems have bias trained in, uh, built into them, uh, that, that's going to make things worse. Uh, and so, you know, we have to sort of, number one, figure out how to detect it. And number two, uh, figure out how to build systems that prevent um, uh, bias. Okay. And so, so one of the reasons that I'm particularly interested in this, uh, there's an aim ahead advisory committee, and I, I've become co-chair of that together with Patty Brennan, who's the head of the Informatics Institute, the National Library of Medicine, um, is that, uh, you know, we want to study things like bias. And uh, how does bias get into the medical record? It, because clinicians write things in the medical record. Okay, you know, the patient was non-compliant. Uh, you know, what, what, is, what does that even mean? You know, there's a lot that uh, goes into a comment like that. And, um, and uh, uh, so much of data that goes in the medical record is subjective. And I have a lot of concerns about you know, how can we study bias using data that are inherently subjective? And so I, I really hope that um, image data are objective and ophthalmic image data, they're, they're so easy to obtain and, uh, you know, compared to other forms of image data. And, you know, we've learned a lot about how much data is embedded in those ophthalmic uh, image data. And, you know, Bruce Tromberg, who we talked about at dinner last night, who, uh, you know, used to be at UC Irvine, and I have had a lot of conversations about this. And Bruce has been great to, great to work with. And, um, but anyway, I, I really hope that, the vision community can play a role in this broader conversation uh, uh, to the extent that ophthalmic image data can anchor some of those subjective um, uh, uh, data about things like, you know, understanding what the basis is of bias and how can we uh, prevent and correct it. Okay, so, so anyway, uh, aim ahead if you're interested in just, just look that up or, you know, uh, James Gao is the program officer at NEI who's the main contact person about that. So, you know, getting close to the end here, um, uh, number six out of seven is quality of life. Okay. And, uh, uh, you know, we built this into our mission statement, okay, improving, uh, eliminating vision loss and improving quality of life. And, you know, all of you uh, know the statistics here. 
that there are a huge number of people in the US, um, you know, regardless of whether it's uh, having low vision, being blind, or, or having, uh, you know, needing eyeglasses. Um, there's a huge number of people, a huge economic burden uh, of that. And uh, it's getting worse as the population ages. Okay, this is uh, uh, eye disease and age. And you, you know how this is going. As we get older, there's more problems. And the population on the whole is getting older and older in this country. And um, uh, one of the things that, so we're interested in that, and we're really interested in this um, uh, uh, importance of incorporating patient perspectives into health-related quality of life outcomes. And uh, you know, some of these are gonna be outcome measures for clinical trials. Uh, some of them are gonna be patient reported outcomes for things like clinical quality measures. Okay, so uh, let, let me just give a couple um, uh, opportunities. Uh, one of them involves um, uh, vision rehabilitation. And uh, here I'm gonna use vision rehabilitation as an example to talk about that, but also make a broader point about research. Okay. Um, so when I was growing up, uh, when we took care of patients who, okay, there's no treatment for your disease. You, know, you have something like uh, you know, uh, inherited retinal degeneration where in 2005, there was no medicine or no gene therapy or you know, gene-based editing that people could do. Um, you know, we would give magnifiers. Okay, we'll make things bigger. Or if they're using computers, you know, you know, use a screen reader to read the screen instead of having people um, you know, read it with their eyes, you'd hear it, um, uh, audio. Uh, now, um, uh, there's a whole set of um, uh, uh, work involving retinal prosthetics. And, and just an example, this was a work that was done by Daniel Polanker at Stanford, uh, together with um, Jose Elaine Sahel uh, from the University of Pittsburgh. And I thought this was really nice work where um, uh, it's a retinal prosthetic where the, um, uh, uh, the patient wears a pair of glasses that has a camera built in that captures the scene here and sends data to a computer that you wear in your pocket. And the computer processes that scene and extracts the key information uh, uh, from it and then uh, sends signals um, uh, you know, through light pulses, inf near infrared light pulses uh, back to the retina. And the patient has a subretinal implant uh, that's implanted, and it basically stimulates bipolar cells, okay, uh, within the retina. And they've actually had great results in terms of outcomes um, uh, uh, of that uh, visual outcomes from these patients. But th the point that I want to make from this number one is that there are emerging uh, approaches to vision rehabilitation. But number two, um, if you look at what went into developing this technology, uh, there were advances in semiconductor physics. Uh, for example, photodiodes, uh, device fabrication. Uh, there were advances in wearable electronics um, and neural engineering and psychophysics. Um, and what fascinated me is that uh, there were Stanford PhD students who were writing their theses on technologies that went into this product. Okay? And then there were Stanford uh, junior faculty that were getting tenured uh, for, for uh, doing that work. And you know, in terms of collaboration, uh, you know, I, I think I see so much collaboration where you've got a doctor and a scientist and the doctor is looking for collaboration that's not methodologically novel for the scientist or the engineer or whoever it is. It's something that's off the shelf. And I don't think we're always going to get the best methodologists. Okay, the best scientists are not going to want to do off the shelf work, you know, in the eye. They're going to want to do something that's methodologically innovative. Okay, and, uh, and I thought this was a great, great example of that. And um, you know, at dinner last night, um, uh, you know, we had, um, uh, you, know, you know, I was talking with Chris Palczewski and you know, he was talking about uh, you know, methodological work that Chang Lu and you know, Kirian and others in bioengineering were doing that I thought was just as methodologically innovative that's now going into these gene editing systems that we're implementing. I thought that's a great example. And I think that those of you in Irvine are an amazing institution where uh, you're right next to the university. Uh, you've got a world-class university and a world-class I group here. And I, I think that there's a lot of room for innovation in areas like this that I'm really excited to be able to follow from this group. Okay, so that, that's the point that I wanted to make um, uh, from this slide. And in terms of, um, uh, quality of life. I, you know, we're in a society um, where um, we're increasingly reliant on computing and mobile devices, right? And the problem is that when you can't see, 
uh, you know, you can't use cell phones the same way. And I think this is a big problem for people with vision loss. And I think we're going to need a lot more work involving user-friendly innovations for accessibility. And, you know, someone once told me um, I, about a week ago that they were at a conference and they heard someone from UC Irvine. I, I think her name was Stacey Branham. Is that, do you know that name at all? Maybe I got it wrong, but she was doing some beautiful work involving accessibility for visually um, uh, impaired patients, uh, you know, right here at Irvine. But, um, but, but anyway, um, I got this video from um, uh, 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 James uh, Coughlin, who's at Smith Kettlewell I Research Institute, but it, it's just an example of one of these. Now I, I muted this. And so let me try to um, uh, make it louder. What? So it's a combination of GPS, um, you know, voice recognition, and uh, uh, just navigation systems. And I'm not sure if it's going to be devices like this or you know, uh, smart canes or something that are really going to be sort of the equivalent of the hearing aid uh, for visually impaired people. But I really think there's a lot of room for um, innovation in this area. And um, lastly. I just want to say that one thing that got onto our radar screens because we saw it in the New York Times <laughs> one morning was um, COVID tests uh, not being accessible to people with visual impairment because you know they can't read the instructions and you can't see the pink line. Uh, and um, you know we really got involved. Actually, this was another Bruce Tromberg uh, thing where Bruce. Um, uh, has uh, been leading this initiative, uh, RADx at NIH, that they were the ones that developed home COVID tests in you know really record uh, times, and um, and, and we started to um, help their group. This is a project that's led by um, NIBIB, Bruce's Institute, uh, but we helped in terms of uh, when this uh, uh, became known. Uh, you know, we've been trying to work on projects to um, uh, make home COVID tests more accessible. Uh, to people who are um, uh, visually impaired. And uh, NIBIB, they have a, a program that's, that's opening applications in a, uh, actually, I think in a few days. Uh, you know, it's really rapid turnaround time. So this is a problem that we're really trying to solve. Okay. And so lastly is public health and disparities. And I, I just want to finish up, um, you know, pretty soon here. Um, uh, now, of course, we know that um, uh, vision loss and blindness, it's one of the leading causes of disability in the U.S., uh, and one of the things, uh, you kind of have to be living under a rock in this pandemic uh, to not realize that this pandemic has really exposed a lot of health disparities uh, within this country. And uh, I, I think that one of the things that's become more clear to me than ever is that the best scientific advances in the world you know, of the sort that we talked about in the last uh, you know, 45 minutes are really not quite as useful if they're not available to the people who need them the most. Okay, and that's something that we're really trying to um, uh, message. Now, in terms of delivery of care, access to care, I don't, maybe telehealth is going to be one of those um, uh, mechanisms. Uh, but if we do that, um, you know, we're really going to have to identify how do we best implement uh, telehealth? Uh, how do we prove that it's effective? And how do we prove that it's cost effective? And you know, a lot of the telehealth research that I see now has to do with, well, how do we create a CPT code so a doctor can bill for it? And uh, I don't think that's how we're gonna develop new models for healthcare um, uh, based on remote uh, monitoring. And it's gonna need some fundamental re-engineering of the healthcare delivery system. And somebody's gotta figure that out. Okay, so I think that there's the room for innovation. And I think that we really need to understand what are the social determinants that are relevant to eye disease. In other words, why are patients going blind from preventable disease in 2022 still in this country? Okay. And um, now that really takes us into, um, you know, we've really been pushing diversity uh, at NIH and at NEI. Why does diversity matter? Um, and now, one of the, I think to clinicians, there's some intuition that if you're taking care of patients, that it, there's some benefit of having healthcare providers that match the demographics of the patients who we're taking care of. Okay. And, uh, and so, I, you know, one thing that um, I've become interested in is, yeah, what's the narrative that we can create for, you know, for, you know, people who do research, you know, how does having a diverse team benefit your research? 
Uh, and so one of the people, there's a guy, Scott Page, at the University of Michigan. You know, Emma, we had this thing that we talked about. I mentioned his name then. He has done some brilliant work. Um, you know, we had him speak at our, uh, at our NEI council meeting about a year ago. And if you don't know his name, uh, and if you're interested in this area, look, look it up. There's some videos and a book that he's written that are, that are fabulous. And so um, the, the message that I want to impart is that I think all of us have the um, uh, intuition that there are benefits of interdisciplinary research. Uh, if you work with a scientist, engineer, a basic scientist, social scientist, engineer, and if you're a doctor, that you have out of the box thinking when you work with people who have different academic backgrounds, right? That, that's kind of obvious. Um, uh, the point here in terms of diversity of humans is that, uh, oh, sorry. Um, there's really, really good evidence that teams with different kinds of thinkers outperform homogeneous groups. In other words, when you get a group of scientists who all went to the same school or all sat in the same lecture, um, that, that, that's not a good recipe for out of the box thinking, okay? Because you all kind of think the same way. Uh, and there was some fascinating examples um, uh, that Scott Page quoted that if you're designing buildings, for example, and if, you know, Emma, this was the example that we had an email exchange afterwards and you highlighted this, and so I'm gonna repeat it, um, that if you um, uh, have a uh, group of people who are designing a building, and if one of the people on the team is visually impaired, the presence of that person on the team, even if they don't say anything, affects the way the team thinks about building design. Well, maybe we should, design it this way, or you know, you're not gonna be able to navigate this that well if you can't see, okay? And you know, we actually came across some great examples of you know, you know, eye drop design, okay, things like that from having people from different racial backgrounds, different populations. And so that's what we've really been trying to message. That, you, know, you, you would do better science if you have diversity on your team. And um, uh, that's something that I don't think we can solve on our own. That at NEI, we need to work with the entire community. That's gonna be academia, industry, Okay, other professional organizations, because I think this is something that we're going to have to, there's good evidence that in vision science, um, we're not as diverse as some areas of science, and in clinical ophthalmology and optometry, we're not as diverse as some other medical specialties. So, um, you know, what have we been doing? Um, uh, well, at the NEI, um, uh, Ashley Fortress, who some of you know, uh, from the um, scientific review process, Brian Hoshaw, and Kathy Anderson have really put together a clinician scientist reviewer program where we're trying to increase the pool of young clinician scientists. Now, why clinician scientists? We, we had to tackle something. And so that, that, that's how we started with clinician scientists. Um, uh, the premise is that we're really trying to um, uh, motivate people from underrepresented groups in science to apply um, for this. But uh, the goal is it's a mentored review process where people like Ashley and Brian and their team uh, help. And the premise here is that if you become a better grant reviewer, you're gonna write better grants. Okay. And this is a QR code that takes you um, uh, uh, to that um, site. And um, uh, you know, our communications people, um, uh, uh, Maria Zacharias and Davina Fan, uh, put together a program called Eye on the Future uh, this past year that was a high school video contest. Uh, high school students basically you know, put together videos and we're trying to get them interested in science and in vision science. Um, and uh, they sent them to us and we, uh, you know, we judged them. And uh, the winners, um, you know, we brought to Bethesda, basically. And uh, you know, this was, these are some pictures of that day and had a day where you know, some of our intramural people you know, dissected you know, animal eyes. And you know, Larry Tabak, who's our acting director, came and spoke at that. And we had a panel with a few people. And yeah, I really hope that's gonna be one, one of those ways that we can build a pipeline of, um, uh, of people who are more interested in science and vision science you know, when they're young. So this is, this is my last slide here. Uh, so how would I try to put this together and what, I, what do I see as the future uh, of ophthalmology? Uh, one of them, I think it's really important to appreciate that you know, in this field, we do work that matters. Okay, uh, you know, from a science perspective and from a uh, you know, quality of life perspective, uh, I really think there's transformative impact of you know, what we do here. And you know, I, I think it's, it's my hope that we can stimulate interdisciplinary collaboration. And that, that's why I love what's going on at this, um, at this university. And um, you know, I think that ophthalmology departments are often isolated. Okay, yeah, I used to work at you know, eye institutes that you know, we, you know, we're our own building over here. And so like, how can we sort of um, uh, you know, adopt that, you know, what I'll call vision institute model? 
okay, the Gavin Herbert Eye Institute. Okay, so that I don't know. Hopefully, that's not the same as the ophthalmology department. Uh, and you know, with the Center for Translational Research, I think that's a huge step in terms of you know, Vladimir, like we were talking about yesterday, sort of branching across and connecting with you know, what well, what are all the areas that connect with vision science? Okay, so I think that that's one thing that I'm really hoping to promote. Um, Number two is something that I put into the slide after dinner last night and that, you know, Jeff, we just talked about, um, you know, our mission is to eliminate vision loss and improve quality of life. And I think that's all, on some level, that's what all of us really want, you know, to, to make the world, you know, a little bit better for people who have eye disease, right? But um, sometimes if I look at what um, motivates the individual investigator, I'm not sure it's always eliminating vision loss. Sometimes what motivates me as an individual investigator, maybe you know, I want to get tenure. You know, I want to write papers, and that's not the same as the overall goal. And I think one thing I hope we can figure out as a community is how do we align incentives and collaboration models to truly solve the problems that we want to solve. Okay, and that, that's going to require some thought. Um, you know, we talked about data sharing as a hallmark of 21st century science, and it, it's like we have to line up. Okay, what are the incentives uh, for data sharing, and what are standards so that we can meaningfully share data? That's something we have to solve as a community. And um, you know, I think that we've talked about a lot of targeted initiatives here. And you know, at some level, we've got to balance. Okay, what's the basic science that's going to have to occur, and how to balance sort of purely curiosity-driven science versus science for purpose? Okay, you know, what, and that, that's something that we're striving to you know get the right balance on. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'm really trying to message the visual system as a site of methodological innovation. And th that's why I loved okay, what was happening here with at dinner last night, Chang Lu and uh, you know, everyone else in biomedical, Kiriako in, in, um, in uh, biomedical engineering, it just as one example of that. I know there's some great work in immunology and some other um, areas here. And uh, uh, lastly, the importance of communicating with stakeholders, okay, what we do and why it's important. So in summary, th that, that's how I put together what my vision is for the future. And uh, you know, thank you very much for the privilege of you know, just letting me speak here today. It was uh, really, truly really fantastic. Uh, so as uh, to organize today event, after uh, questions, we will have a four presentation, very short. So stay on and, and listen to uh, youngsters uh, presenting their data. But uh, with questions from the web, let's start with David Lu. Are you there? David Lee? That's some more. She's not. It there. looks like he left. Uh, Anand, uh, are you there? Any other comments and questions? No, I'm here, but I don't really have any uh, specific comment. I was just responding to David's uh, uh, David's ideas. Thanks. All right. Um, uh, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Yes, I am here. Yes. Any comments, questions? Thank you. Well, that was absolutely beautiful talk with with, but you're missing one key stakeholder throughout, I think, although maybe I missed it, and that's the patient. At um, Sick Kids, we have a patient who is a patient in research, a full active member of our team. Um Brenda, it's great to hear you. And um thank you for that comment. Uh let me just sort of comment on that. It, that's a great point. Um Three months ago, I went to a conference in Boston that was sponsored by the Perkins uh, School for the Blind. And um, I commented when I was, and the audience there was mostly patients and families and sort of patient advocates. And I commented when I made my remarks that for having worked for 20 years, that was the first meeting that I'd ever been at that was predominantly a patient meeting. And I thought, isn't that wrong? You know, that I've been doing this for 20 years. And so I think that's exactly the point that you're trying to make. And um, Brenda, the reason that I was there was that the purpose of that meeting is that we've gotten interested. One thing I didn't talk about here was cerebral visual impairment. And that got onto our uh, radar screen is something that's important. And there's a lot of things that we learned about that precisely that came from families. Uh, and so, so I, I really couldn't agree more. And I, I appreciate your pointing that out. Um, 
you know, just one quickie, um, Anand, nice to hear your voice. And it's good that the world has gotten smaller to see people, you know, from back in Bethesda, even though I'm out in, Oregon, uh, out in um, Irvine. Well, they are very frequent in our meetings, including yeah. uh, Dr. Agarwal. Yep. All right, Dorota. Um, Dr. Chan, that was fantastic overview and comprehensive, thoughtful. I really enjoyed it. And I love the great push for collaborative research. I think this is very important also in the field of uh, working on understanding the mechanism of the diseases. So actually I have a question. Um, are there plans for cross NIH initiatives uh, to understand the mechanisms? So for example, common RFAs with NIBDK for diabetic retinopathy or uh, for even more relevant for all visual fields with uh, uh, Institute of Aging. Um, so I think we miss it. I think this is collaboration within only our field. It's exactly what you just said, rather the insti cross institute than just um, within the institute. Um, thank you for making that point. So cross institute collaborations. Um, I'm going to give a two part answer to that. Um, one of them is that there are mechanisms for doing that already because there's no reason that we can't um, you know, collaborate and come up with a joint RFA on something. Now, from the reaction on your face, and I purposely said that to elicit a reaction because the premise of your question is that we don't do that already in a way that's satisfactory. Uh, and so one of the things that I, I, I hope this came across in the talk that um, one of the things I really believe in is this premise of the eye as a window to the rest of the body, either human body or the body of science. And I, I tried to select examples that uh, choose that. And so, um, you know, we're really trying to reach out to those other areas that I feel like can be partners. And, uh, and there, there's a few areas, like a few places where we've had, um, uh, you know, really serious discussions have been uh, groups like NIMHD, Minority Health, in, in the spirit of disparities, and there's other sort of natural partners. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, NIDDK uh, and, you know, and aging. Uh, and uh, so I'm really hoping to be able to do things like that. Now, um, if you um, have specific areas, uh, you know, don't be shy to reach out about that. And those are areas where, of course, you can't be too specific you know, because you know, there are things, but like, you know, if you think that there are things that really should be on our radar screen as opportunities, um, you know, th that's the reason that I talk about social media and stuff that we really want to, you know, just direct message me or something, something like that. Because I think that that's, I, we really want to sort of understand a little bit of what's happening out there and, you know, what, what really is state of the art. But thank you for raising that. Let's go to Alan. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, hi. So, Michael, thank you so much for a wonderful view into the potential future and your new emphasis, the emphasis areas. But one thing that was missing from the talk was some kind of a, a, a nod toward prevention. And it seems to me that the return on investment in prevention would be enormous. So would you want to comment about that? Um. You know, Alan, thank you for raising that. And this this goes into the spectrum of, you know, just because I didn't say something doesn't feel like I don't, doesn't mean I don't think it's important. Um, I completely agree. And in um, uh, population health, uh, you know, I, I think one of those premises is that, uh, yeah, I saw Anand, yeah, I'm just looking, prevention is better than cure. And I, I, I totally agree. And just maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just leave it at that. And just great, great point. Thank you. Mayor, are you there? If not, unfortunately, we will have Dr. Swaro commenting. So that is going to be strong. Ah, all yours. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, thanks, Michael. That was wonderful. Um, and I'm glad you presented your vision to, you know, to all of us once again, and it was much clearer. I do have a comment uh, based on what you said along the way about curiosity-driven research. I actually personally believe that curiosity is what drives many of us in science and also uh, in uh, you know, the engineers and innovator thinkers. 
And much of the translational work that we talk about today uh, is really based on the research of uh, doyens or those, those lot of those people uh, who have had a curious mind, starting from Newton thinking about apple falling from a tree to everyone else uh, thinking about it. So I, I think there has to be a balance and we should not deny uh, basic research is due while we are carrying out clinical and I mean, I think uh, both are very important, but curiosity is really what drives many scientists. I, I, th that's my view at least. Yeah, Anand, thank you for saying that. It's good to see you. I didn't realize I can look around here and actually see you on the screen. Um, and, you know, I, I totally agree. And the one question that I, the one, the reason that I put that bullet point in there is that we talk about strategic planning and uh, the majority, significant majority of our portfolio is always going to be investigator initiated research. Okay, and, uh, and so in terms of curiosity-driven science, that, 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 that's just the way things are. And um, now, uh, I, and obviously I hope people are gonna read our strategic plan because we had smart people uh, you know, look at this and identify what are those areas that they feel are most promising. Um, but with that said, um, I think that one of the things that I hope we can stimulate more of is stuff that we did in this room this morning like getting smart people who are curious, uh, who are young and looking for things to do uh, together, who come from different backgrounds. Because uh, I think that there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, let's say even curiosity-driven science that's kind of left on the table when people don't see the other side of, you know, why is it that I might want to be doing what I'm doing or what's, uh, you know, what, what is possible with today's technologies. And I think that there's something that scientists contribute to that. And I think that there's something that clinicians can contribute to that. And so I think that there's a lot, a, a phrase like curiosity driven science. I think there's a lot that's underlying that, that, um, that, that I hope we can build on. And so, you know, really, really great points. And just, I, that's something that we're gonna build on. I, I think there's a lot, you know, what is the right mix between one and the other? But I, I think there's some questions about what does it mean to be purely curiosity driven science? Thank you so much. This was a great segue to the next part.